Welcome everyone and welcome to the Project ECHO, um, the Westwick PHN hub and this is the series four, session two and it always comes right in front of my screen. Um, so it's Tuesday the 23rd of May and this is the the ECHO series run by the Spider Network from the Westwick PHN and today's session is entitled The Things Health Professionals Must Consider Before Prescribing or Increasing Psychotropic Medication. Um, and it's in the context of people with an intellectual disability, which our sessions are about. Um, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to just acknowledge the traditional owners um, and custodians of the land and waterways from which we are zooming in from today. We recognise their diversity, resilience and ongoing place that First Peoples hold in our communities. And we pay our respect to the elders, both past and present, and commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation. And we support self-determination of First Nations peoples, organisations that work together on closing the gap. So my name is Robert Ward and I'm a full-time GP working in Geelong and for the past 12 months I've been working with the SPIDER project and presenting these ECHO sessions, which we've gone through various scenarios and points of interest in trying to increase the availability of healthcare to people with an intellectual disability, because um, it's been recognised that um, this particular population um, have, have difficulty accessing primary healthcare and these sessions are trying to bring people together to discuss that further and to come up with some solutions. So I'll just go um, quickly through some introductory slides. Um, the the etiquette for these Zoom set, for these um, echo sessions um, is if you can introduce yourself in the chat, that'd be really nice. We'd like to know who's who's on board, um, and there's a bit of a link to the um, to what a Zoom uh, to what a echo session is about. And just a reminder um, for for privacy and just for confidentiality, particularly of the cases, we will be recording the didactic presentation tonight, um, but not the case study. Um, so case studies are a really important part of these um, sessions and they um, give you an opportunity to bring in um, concerns or cases that have been worrying you and put them towards a panel of people who um, the ECHO project have assembled to, to talk to us on our subjects and they get, provide some really invaluable insights. So if you have any cases that you'd like to bring towards the panel and have a discussion with people um, who work in that area, uh, feel free to click on um, the link there and put the case studies in and the team can help you um, put that case together. There are some professional development opportunities um, through there. And I think we all, GPs can click on their phone now through an app, which is really great um, to count these sessions. Um, and you can certainly contact um, the workforce development team via an email on the slide there if you want further information for your professional development. There is a survey um, if you can take some time to complete that, I think the link's in the um, on the screen there and is in the chat, so we can um, click on those. It'd be really good. So for today's session, um, we're going to, um, in a sort of usual format, is is have a didactic presentation. And today our presenter is Coralie Holding, who's the director of Clear Thinking Mental Health Group and a mental health nurse practitioner and specialist behaviour support practitioner. Uh, has over 40 years experience working in a range of senior clinical and managerial settings in both public and private mental health practice. Um, and the Clear Thinking Mental Health Group provides strength-based solutions focused on the whole person approach and consider all elements um, currently impacting on mental health, and I think is based around the Ballarat area. So we welcome Coralie today for our talk. And our panel members, um, to discuss um, the medications um, and their use in people with intellectual disability uh, is Connie Wu, who's the clinical consultant chem in chemical restraint and from the Victoria Senior Practitioner. Um, so welcome, Connie, to our discussion today. It's nice to have you here. And we also welcome back Andrew Pridding, who's been with us before, and he's the nurse practitioner for the Victorian Dual Disability Service at, based at St Vincent's Hospital. Um, who gives really good reports if you ever refer someone to Andrew is a wonderful way of getting getting the information um, in a terrific way to understand. And our case presentation today, I think will be done remotely via uh, with with Sarah Gillespie, who's an accredited pharmacist um, to talk about medications 
and their use in people with intellectual disability. So I've got some learning outcomes for today, which I think have been the same throughout the sessions, sessions to really recall the terminology and use describing intellectual disability, um, identify solutions to support people with an intellectual disability, access primary health care, um, and to recognise that there are some disparities and in health inequities with people with intellectual disability, um, to discuss the United Nations Convention on the rights of a person with a disability, um, and to summarise how to implement reasonable adjustments, which we've discussed in these sessions before. And some learning outcomes uh, for this session that are on the screen there. So to identify key considerations when prescribing pharmatropics to people with an intellectual disability, um, to recall information clinicians need to obtain before prescribing or before increasing the medications for people with a disability, intellectual disability, and to detail particular circumstances that prescribing um, psychotropics is challenging, should challenging behaviour occur. So they're the, sort of the introductory slides. So we nice to get through those nice and quickly because it's got a lot to talk about and a really interesting subject. So I'd like to introduce Coralie because um, uh, our presentation today is the things health professionals must consider before prescribing or increasing psychotropic drugs. And I suppose um, as a general practitioner, we've all had patients who are on an extensive list of medications um, and some of them we don't even know where they came from or who prescribed them or what they were treating. Um, for some reason, that sort of health information has just lost over time. Um, even when I think back to, to my own son um, with his intellectual disability, he was put on fluoxetine at age three um, and was on that for a, for a very long time with very little um, review process um, from from the paediatrician or from anyone. I think in his, in his early 20s, my wife and I sort of decided, yeah, I think we need to stop this. But it was a really scary time to actually work out because we didn't know what was going to happen. We'd been, it was put on it at a fairly um, desperate time for our family and it seemed to have great effects. And gee, that was the scariest thing in the world, trying to think about do we stop it um, and do we reduce it? But we reduced it and nothing bad happened and it was all good. So we probably wish we'd done it a little bit earlier. Um, and I, the other thing I also recall is, is as, a, as a doctor going through my training that I was taught um, not to reduce or stop any medications, particularly when I was on the psychiatric rotation going through outpatients, seeing people. It wasn't my job to actually reduce or do anything like that. It was just to keep all the status quo as people came for their regular reviews without anyone thinking about um, reducing medication, especially when there was a junior doctor seeing them. Um, so I don't think anyone got their medication reduced. So I'm really here to really keen to hear from Coralie tonight. So thank you, Coralie. I'd like to hear about your observations and really thoughtful insights into medication use. And so we can have open up some discussion. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, being a didactic presentation, I did the safe thing and used the Australian prescriber, but I'm happy to go off script after we've gone through the rules and regulations of best practice, because then there's a real world that um, intercepts at that point. So things health professionals must consider before prescribing or increasing psychotropic medication. Next slide. So the rates of mental illness among people with an intellectual disability are at least two and a half times higher than the general population. So it's a significant concern that this mental illness is often undetected. And the challenges in this include communication difficulties, atypical presentations, coordinating multidisciplinary care, and the paucity of inter specialist intellectual disability mental health services. Um, the inappropriate use of psychotropics is common and include the overuse of psychotropic drugs to treat challenging behaviour, excessive dosage and duration of treatment, which uh, Robert has touched on, and polypharmacy. And there is often inadequate monitoring of adverse effects or even knowing what those effects might look like. Next slide. So as I've said, mental illness is common in people with an intellectual disability, but they may also have physical health problems which can affect their mental state. Difficulties in communication can contribute to mental health problems being overlooked, and these may present with challenges in behaviour. 
psychological management is usually preferable to prescribing psychotropic drugs and behavioural approaches are the most appropriate way to manage challenging behaviour. If a drug is considered, prescribers should complete a thorough diagnostic assessment, exclude physical and environmental contributions to symptoms and consider medical comorbidities before prescribing. Where possible, avoid psychotropics with the highest cardiometabolic burden. Um, and that's, unfortunately, they're the most common ones that I'm interacting or I'm finding, um, the olanzapine, quetiapine and risperidone. So they're the ones that are most commonly found um, in our practice. Um, prescribe the minimum effective dose and treatment length and regularly monitor drug efficacy and adverse effects. So the cardiometabolic syndrome is often poorly managed in this patient cohort. There's insufficient evidence to support the use of psychotropics for challenging behaviour, and they should be avoided unless the behaviour is severe and non-responsive to other treatments. So behaviour support practitioner role is extremely important in determining uh, what is a behaviour and what is a symptom, because often these people may have been long-term residents of care homes with little um, engagement with medical facilities and minimal training in the staff. So you can still come across some very unusual situations in terms of the prescribing patterns and what is actually going on for the person. So not necessarily just in Ballarat, but in the uh, smaller towns, perhaps an hour away, we're finding some um, very interesting situations that do require more specialist intervention. Next slide. So where practical, psychotropic prescribing for challenging behaviour should be under specialist supervision. And I think that's really, really important and it's not what's happening. And it should only be occurring when the challenging behaviour is severe in nature, persistent and places the person or others at risk, that maximal non-pharmaceutical interventions have already been tried unsuccessfully, and the drug of choice is likely to treat the problem behaviour. Consent for off-label prescription has been obtained from uh, family, from whoever is um, taking some responsibility for the care of that person and the person and the care has been informed of any extra financial costs associated with off-label prescribing. What we're finding is instead of that occurring, the, the diagnosis is following the prescription rather than this prescription following the diagnosis. So we will often see somebody diagnosed with, uh, say, schizophrenia, for instance, and having a subtherapeutic dose of risperidone that's clearly used there as chemical control, um, 25 milligrams uh, PRN plus 25 milligrams Nocte. That's not a dose you would expect to see in someone with schizophrenia. So often the, the dosage that you're seeing will give you a good indication of whether that diagnosis is uh, likely to be true. Next slide. So con key considerations when prescribing psychotropic drugs to people with an intellectual disability, and before prescribing, think about these things. Is there a confirmed diagnosis of mental illness for which the psychotropic medication is indicated? Is the challenging behaviour severe and non-responsive to maximal cognitive or behaviour therapy, or have they even been tried, and are they available? Do the potential benefits outweigh the harm? And again, the metabolic syndrome is something to consider there. Has there been discussion with the carer? And developing a treatment plan. So the person's communication needs, what are we targeting? Their behavior, symptom, frequency, intensity of that behavior. The method of measurement of impact of these drugs on behavior, including how effects and adverse effects will be assessed. Again, an area I find a great deal of problem with, um, with support houses, um, insufficient training, insufficient funding to train the staff, uh, insufficient interest in actually wanting to, to do things differently to how they were done 20 years ago. Um, that's 
an area of concern that's ongoing. Um, developing the treatment plan detailing all previous assessments of medical, psychiatric and functional causes of behavioural symptom, past response to treatment, including adverse effects. And sometimes these people have been through a range of um, institutions where that information has been lost and it, you can spend an awful lot of time trying to find out where a diagnosis came from or what treatment has been had in the past. And, and sometimes it's to the point where we simply have to start again and uh, start those, those new diagnostic um, sessions. Uh, having a treatment timeline and contingency plan, if effective, um, as Robert has mentioned, often something has started and continues and it continues and it continues and there is no treatment timeline or contingency plan um, and there is very much the if it's not broken don't touch it uh, so we see a lot of medications that have been there for a long time and one of the uh, most rewarding situations I had was a 23 year old fellow who was on large doses of um, antipsychotics mood stabilizers benzos and had been on them since he was five. And at 23, he's off everything. He does have a diagnosis of ASD, um, but he doesn't need any of those psychotropic medications and he's living semi-independently. So certainly a treatment timeline and contingency plan is um, really important. Um, Andrew's just, I've sometimes been successful in getting details from PBS. Ah, yeah, okay. Good thinking. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and ensuring we obtain consent from the independent individual or appointed decision maker in relation to the treatment of a person. Um, again, in young people where they're living with family, that's much easier to do. Um, we provide outreach to some country towns and some of those people um, don't have a a guardian, uh, their family's no longer involved or in fact may have been deceased and nobody's been appointed in the meantime to be that person's decision making maker. So nothing changes. Um, next slide. So to round it up, specific evidence for the eff efficacy of psychotropic drugs in people with an intellectual disability and mental illness in general um, there is an absence of substantial evidence base and clinicians should adapt approaches applicable to the general population. So in that we have to, yes, consider the diagnosis, but also consider how would we treat this person if not for that diagnosis? Is this what we would be doing? And I think that's a really important thing to do. Place yourself as a family member. Is this how you would want your loved one to be cared for? Have you put enough thought into what your options are? Treating challenging behaviour with psychotropic drugs should be restricted to situations where the behaviour is severe and risks harm to self and others and has not responded adequately to non-pharmacological approaches. Again, not always happening. Clinicians should exercise extra vigilance when prescribing and monitoring psychotropic drug therapy given the uh, multiple medical comorbidities and communication difficulties. So it's difficult to find out whether what you're doing is of benefit and benefit to who? Is it benefit to the client or is it benefit to the support staff who are caring for the client? And it's much easier if they're quietly not doing very much during the day. So who is it that we're treating and who is it that we're helping? Um, ensuring that we engage with care of family or support staff and careful monitoring of behavioural changes may help to identify emerging adverse effects. And the BSP format is quite good at every medication that's listed must have a list of adverse side effects. Um, and also I, I, most people add in what is the intention to improve with this medication? So this, what is the purpose for that? GPs often don't like filling out the list of what is this medication being prescribed for and when they do it's often again um, not it wouldn't stand up to scrutiny um, it, it clearly has been they've been pressured by the 
support staff or the support home to tick a box in a particular piece of paper and sign off and they haven't known any other way to do it, but, again, not particularly well done. Um, thoughtful prescribing that accounts for the diagnosis and underlying medical conditions that may be aggravated. So, as we know, um, some antipsychotics can increase the risk of epilepsy. Um, there's a range of conditions that can be exacerbated by psychotropic medications. Next slide, and I don't know whether you've got that one, the last one. Okay, so monitoring treatment, making sure that we engage the person in the monitoring process, set regular timeframes for treatment reviews, be aware of adverse effects that may be difficult to recognise, watch for behavioural change after starting treatment or a dose increase or decrease, and discontinue treatment where it is ineffective or there are unacceptable adverse effects. And who decides what is unacceptable? Because if the GP only has the information from a support worker, I would say that in many cases that's inadequate and the GP is not being given um, sufficient information on which to make a often complex decision. Um, discontinuation should uh, be requested where the symptoms have resolved or the drug is no longer required making sure that any taper is done slowly and avoiding the simultaneous withdrawal of any medication. So very slow withdrawal as you um, de-prescribe any medications with any of these clients. So that's the end of my presentation and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that people might have um, in relation to what we're seeing in the field. Um, we have probably probably 200 um, BSP clients. So that's quite a, a number of cases with which to draw um, conclusions from what's happening out in the wider space. So if anyone's got any questions, more than happy to uh, respond. Thanks, thanks Coralie. Um, from a from all the people you, you look after with their general practitioners, do you find that the, they are confident in prescribing or does it really vary? It varies greatly. Yeah. Um, and where there's a mental health diagnosis um, of a serious mental illness such as schizophrenia or a, a mood disorder, I always try to have a psychiatrist review mm -hmm. and um, engage with the GP so there's additional support there. So where there's serious mental illness in conjunction with uh, an intellectual disability or ASD or other uh, complicating factor, I think it's a bit much to leave to a GP to manage all of that by themselves. And mm. I don't think that that's fair and reasonable. Yeah, I mean, I certainly concur with a lot of your comments, particularly about the diagnosis being retrospective sometimes. Oh, yeah. And I mean, sometimes GPs find themselves in a rock and a hard place because oh, you've, you've been prescribing something when you've told the, the pharmaceutical benefit scheme that they have schizophrenia and then all of a sudden you, you have to say, well, no, they don't. So you've just been writing it on your scripts for the last two years. Yeah. Um, you've dug a, dug a bit of a hole for yourself. Mm. Um, so I, I can certainly it's a difficult position. Yeah, and certainly um, even I'm noticing at um, a large regional hospital, their medical officers will write a diagnosis to meet the criteria to avoid it being considered restrictive practice. Mm. Um, so there's education that's required in all prescribers, I guess, to have the confidence that it's okay to use chemical restraint. Sometimes it's the best way forward for that client because they can then access the community. They can do things that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. It shouldn't be seen as the great taboo. Only when it's used inappropriately should it be considered under that umbrella. Thank you. I wonder if Andrew or Connie had any comments about that, Andrew? Yes, thank, thanks, uh, Coralie. That's that was a very um, good refresher. Um, how much metabolic monitoring do you think is going on? Because my experience is hardly any. I've not seen any. And and have you come across any formal assessment for movement disorders or any other side effects? Never. No, that's my experience too. Yeah. 
Um, and we're finding that there's a bit of pushback from some organisations because it's too hard. Um, they We're going into places where they're uncomfortable. And so perhaps we'll go with a behaviour support organisation that doesn't have a, a person with medical knowledge in there because then they're not going to bring up all these unpleasant and uncomfortable questions. Mm. So that that's in itself is a problem, not because we need the business, but because there's a way to avoid um, accurate scrutiny. There should not be anywhere to hide in any of this. And I've, I've certainly seen a number of people where akathisia has been the main problem and is causing the agitation and, and the, the behaviour. Yeah. Uh, but it's being misinterpreted as worsening of the behaviour and then yes. the, the antipsychotics being increased and that's just creating a vicious cycle and the person ends up on huge amounts of multiple medications. Yeah. Fortunately, I'm able to de-prescribe um, if I'm handed responsibility for that person. So I've seen a, a, a mute young man on eight milligrams of risperidone whose GP just kept putting up two milligrams at a time, mm. up to eight milligrams until he was a writhing mess. Um, I think 16 milligrams of oral respiratory oh, today is the highest we can cross. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but again, um, I'm not wishing to uh, get up anybody's nose, but we all have to acknowledge that there is a major issue here and that we all share responsibility for finding a way forward and there shouldn't be any... I think GPs are expected to do everything for everyone. I think they've they do a marvelous job, but they can't do everything. They shouldn't be expected to. And where we do have that capacity to provide that little narrow focus of this is this is all I do, um, then I think that we should be able to provide that uh, as much as possible. But I think that there needs to be, in terms of behavior support, um, we see a lot of plans coming across from other practitioners and there isn't adequate scrutiny being done um, in many of these plans. We pick them up and we find the wrong diagnosis, inadequate or inaccurate treatment. Um, the medication is a chemical restraint. It's totally, these people are being paid a lot of money for doing something that's not worth the paper it's written on. And, and what do you think the... Um competence of the direct support workers is in terms of implementing behavioural um, strategies? Really very, very poor. Um, and again, this is a generalisation. Some organisations do much, much better than others. And we tend to work with organisations um, who um, are taking people out of secure extended care and doing the pointy end of psychiatry, as well as doing um, intellectual disability. but. Um, in the psychiatry end, they're possibly doing a little bit better because it's newer. They haven't, we haven't had support workers in psychiatry before. So it's a different cohort. Um, the disability support workers may have been there for 20 or 30 years and they're quite unwilling to change. So there's some, these old group homes um, in some of these country towns where there's been no scrutiny for a long time. They used to write their own internal BSPs. Um, it, it took the first two years before we actually got much headway with them. Fortunately, now it's it's going very well, um, but it, it, it's not easy work. And if you don't have that knowledge of, of diagnosis and medications, I don't know how people are doing BSPs. Kerry, you've got your hand up there. Yeah, thanks, Robert. I just wanted to say to Coralie and, and others in the room, <clears throat> I guess from a um, being a manager in Resi for over 10 years, the issue, and, and I think it's still current today, I don't think it's changed necessarily because I've been out of the field, but certainly when do support workers actually get trained in it? There's a transient workforce and there's a workforce that often English is their second language. So one of the things that, you know, I'd be interested in hearing about Coralie and from others is about looking at how do we actually promote 
setting people up in positions to actually do some observations and learn about looking at behaviours and mapping what's actually happening so that they can bring that information to the GP and it can be mapped over a period of time so people can recognise it. Andrew very kindly gave um, sent a doc some documentation to us um, by um, um, his name is Moss, the surname, it's from the UK, and it is a bit of a signs and symptoms tracker to actually start to look at um, doing observations. And, I, and one of the things I feel that's really important for support workers, whether it be um, a physical problem or any change in behaviour, that we can start to actually have a look at that and recognise the signs and symptoms and record that information to bring it to the GP to assist with observing and understanding those changes. When it comes to actually increasing medications, it's as you say, for someone like myself who was in a manager's position, we'd come in and there'd be all kinds of stuff going on. There'd be five clients, um, two staff ratio, um, never enough comparatively for, for what was some of the complex issues that each member of that household might have. And then if someone does become um, um, demonstrate a behaviour of concern for whatever that might be, it's a risk response and mm. managing keeping everybody else safe rather than being able to do potentially what is then necessary to go back and do the observations and actually have a look at what's happening and how that they can circumvent that. So part of that is also directly related to the environmental aspects Absolutely. when you have these kinds of complex issues and then you've got the tension between staff being able to needing to be kept um, safe in the workplace and have a duty of care to them as well as to the person they're working with so I guess Coralie I agree with you when we're talking about the old group homes and the way that workers have been in some regards forced to actually operate because they haven't been taught any better haven't been taught about medication and there hasn't been a lot of people that make those um, recommendations or that go and help upskill people to, to learn how to do those and as you've said now that there, there's behaviorists on board and some of the stuff that's being presented isn't worth the paper they're written on because there's the tensions or then going to the senior practitioner's office and then reporting that information and what you're doing to bring people off those medications again there's the same complex set of of um, circumstances where you don't change to have how many people staff work with complex clients you've got different age groups you've got different complexities people are presenting with it, you've got different staff that's enough to upset the household just on a day-to-day -day basis and if a person's sick sorry you still have to go to day program today so until we actually then have a look at the systems that that people are working in with rigor and upskill um, support workers to understand their role in working in what is a complex environment and understand to give them the skills, how do we then support GPs to be able to then help do their job and or where that crossover is, as we talked a little bit about a fortnight ago, when does a GP then go across and hand across to, to a psychiatrist for the expertise that's required to make a formal diagnosis? Yeah, I was, I was wondering if we have to go into the case study very soon because it's quite it's quite a long yep. pre-recorded one. Um, Connie, do you have any comments from your point of view? Um, yeah, I guess just some of the points raised um, already. One is about presenting the right information to the GP so that they can make um, you know informed decisions instead of support workers presenting every new symptom as a new medical condition and the doctor's pressure to prescribe to manage that new presentation within a 10 minute consult. Um, so I'd be interested to hear from Coralie, maybe um, you've got some tips around how the data can be presented to GP in a very summarized form um, uh, in terms of effectiveness. And secondly, I guess um, from the Victoria Senior Practitioner's perspective, We've been um, upskilling behaviour support practitioners and service providers on how to communicate with GPs. Um, you know, first of all, how to identify what could be considered chemical restraint along with the information they get from the prescriber, but also some of the side effects that they can identify and, you know, um, pass on to the GP. Um, and I think what's really clear is the lack of understanding within the um, 
service providers of how general practices operate. So we, we're getting a lot of resistance even before we start the conversation. Um, you know, the, the tension around the medication purpose form and how some GPs wouldn't fill that out without an appointment. Um, so I think we're just starting from the very beginning, that conversation, we just recently held a workshop actually, and um, it was quite a positive workshop. So I just ran through how the general practices need to operate um, and um, you know how they can make it easier for the GPs and removing some of those proof or barriers. So one is bringing data to the GPs. Um, the other one is, looking for the right time and schedule appointments. Um, if it's going to be a discussion, anything to, to do with medications is going to be complex. Um, and then not questioning the doctor's clinical decision-making. Um, that seems to be, I think, you know, um, sometimes it, it's just the communication just doesn't happen from the get-go just because of the way a particular question is phrased. So I guess that's our focus at the moment at the Victoria Senior Practitioner's Office. Um, but we are still trying to figure out, even with our pilot programming, working more closely with GPs, how we can present the data um, and get support workers to record it, first of all, um, and then perhaps for the behaviour support practitioner to collate that data and um, pass that on to the GP in a timely way. Thanks, Connie. I think we, we probably do need... I, I can... See Whitney getting all anxious there about the, <laughs> the long case study she's got to do. Um, we might, um, if no one else has any any questions, we can always you can always put them in the chat uh, and email to them later. I, I wonder if we could play Sarah's um, Sarah um, Gillespie is an accredited pharmacist, so she's kindly presented a case for us. So I'd like to introduce myself first of all. My name is Sarah Gillespie. I'm an accredited pharmacist and I reside in Canberra. And I've been invited to give this very brief overview uh, to you all. Um, medication management services for people with intellectual disability and autism. Next slide, please. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, these few slides and some background information to Manya Angley and Sam Bogue. Manya Angley Research and Consulting. Sam is a physiotherapist in South Australia from the organisation I Can Jump Puddles. And together, they're part of the Pompeda group. And I'm also part of that Pompeda group. And Pompeda means pharmacists optimizing medicines in intellectual disability and autism. Next slide. So Pompeda is actually a community of practice of pharmacists who provide medication services to the disability sector through collaboration with various disability organisations. And in principle, support um, has been obtained from the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia. The, the PSA is my current employer. Um, for the past 15 years, I actually worked for the Australian Association of Consultant Pharmacy. That organisation closed at the end of 2022. And during my time there, I was involved in the um, accreditation process for pharmacists, and that involves um, an assessment program for um, accreditation. And accreditation mm -hmm. um, entitles pharmacists to be remunerated for comprehensive medication management reviews. And those medication reviews are those conducted in the home, home medicine reviews, and those conducted in aged care, so residential medication management reviews. Just a, a few words about those. Those um, medication reviews are remunerated to the pharmacist by the Commonwealth Government on referral from a GP. This uh, presentation will be separated. So the next few slides are just um, a little bit about um, the background to how accredited pharmacists can support um, medication use in these environments. 
So what the Pompeda Group has done is that they're aiming to raise awareness and improve access to medication reviews. And so what they've done is they developed, developed a flow diagram, um, and this flow diagram may actually be useful to Kerry and Nicole as they're working towards um, developing a model um, in your area. So it's a process by which stakeholders in the disability sector can trigger a medication review. And just to add that pharmacists are a key thread in the safety net. And so our role in medication review is to uh, promote the quality use of medicines, of course, to reduce adverse effects, to avoid polypharmacy where possible, to deprescribe where indicated, also to ensure that um, medication safety issues are addressed and that medication misadventure is reduced. We all know that um, medications are very powerful substances and our key role um, in this process is to provide guidance um, on the appropriate use of medicines. Next slide. So, um, one thing that's really important for the work of pharmacists is to collaborate with other professional staff so this is just talking about the roles, the other roles of the pharmacist. So what we can do when we're collaborating with the healthcare professionals is to monitor the physical health and adverse effects, um, including use of a monitoring chart. So what we can do is advise the um, behaviour specialists and the care staff to observe for any particular adverse effects which may be uh, medicine related. Um, also, one thing that we can do is to encourage the client themselves to self-report. It may well be that if a new medicine is introduced or a medicine is ceased or a dose has changed, that an unusual side effect, an unusual adverse effect uh, could occur. And so what we would like to be able to do is to encourage the client themselves to self-report any unusual um, things that um, they've experienced. And so it's working with uh, appropriate communication tools to ensure that that could happen. Um, if the client has changed behaviours, um, what we would like to think about is whether or not there are any underlying triggers um, that may be contributing to these changed behaviours. There may have been a fall, they may be in pain, um, and the pain is expressing itself in a changed behaviour. Um, there may be the occurrence of a urinary tract infection, um, which may trigger unusual behaviours. Um, there may be a problem with as um, we'll see with some of these medications, they can cause dry mouth, um, have effect on um, dental uh, conditions. So um, it may be a, an issue with a tooth pain. Um, and there can be lots of different things um, that may or may not be related to medicines or physical health that can trigger um, underlying um, certainly behaviours. So the other thing that I think is really important to emphasise is to um, really encourage support workers to understand that a when required chemical restraint is absolutely a last resort. Next slide. We can um, ensure that appropriate person-centred, non-pharmacological interventions have been considered and trialled. We can also trigger um, a sort of further medication review um, by a GP or a medical specialist. So that's a psychiatrist, a paediatrician or a neurologist. That's a fairly um, new um, uh, change to the program rules for home medicine reviews that they, um, in the past, they were always referred just by a GP. But for the past two years, a medication review um, can be referred by a psychiatrist, a paediatrician or neurologist or in fact, any um, physician. So it could be a cardiologist, an endocrinologist. And so 
It's really important, though, that um, all of these medical practitioners are working as a team. And so we like to see information that might be um, gained by a consultant, by a medical specialist, shared with the, the GP, because, of course, they have the um, the day-to-day -day management of that patient um, to think about. So with a, um, a comprehensive medication review, um, the target would be those um, patients, clients who are prescribed psychotropic medication, or as we've seen with Josh, who's actually prescribed several psychotropic medications. And also we think about targeting polypharmacy. Now that particular medication list for Josh um, was actually fairly simple, but I have seen others which might include up to 20 medicines. So um, part of the pharmacist's role is sifting through all those medicines and um, working out um, which ones are appropriate, which are not any drug interactions. Um, so it's a, a very comprehensive report. If psychotropic medications are necessary, what we would like to ensure is that informed consent is obtained wherever possible. So that's something that's really important to think about uh, with these patients. The other thing that is very important is to think about health literacy. So pharmacists um, are trained to um, be able to communicate um, with other health professionals and also their patients. So it's explaining to patients where possible, clients where possible, um, about their medicines and about possible adverse effects. And there are excellent um, sort of um, tools that we can use to assist us in communicating with patients and um, behaviour support specialists and other people involved in patient care. So just some communication tips that we like to think about. Um, so body language is important. Um, so we like to know that um, we, um, you know, people make an effort to understand us. Um, so time is needed. So time is really important. This type of review can't be rushed. So one of the things that pharmacists are skilled at is that we explain words in everyday language and it's important also to avoid slang or jargon. We need to be able to break down the big ideas so that people can readily understand what we're talking about. We need to focus on one topic at a time, not provide lots of different bits of information all at once. So it's slow and steady and important information first. We like to be consulted regularly and we like to be involved in patient care. And that's something that's really important. We, when we're communicating, we repeat new information we ask open questions so we get the type of answers we need to work with um, other health professionals and patients and clients. Also, we need to check if someone else needs to um, be involved in the interview. Reading easy read tools, that's what I mentioned before. We need to be very careful if we're having telephone conversations. Using pictures is important. And always at the end of the day, pharmacists are there to answer questions. So that's just some um, very basic tips um, about communication. This is just a breakdown of some of the medication related issues identified um, after seeing Josh. Um, so um, both uh, risperidone and chlorpromazine were prescribed together. Now, the use of two antipsychotics together is not recommended. Um, so also the current risperidone dose is four milligrams daily, and that's the uh, that's a higher dose than that approved by the TGA, and they recommend a maximum of two point five um, milligrams per day.
So remember also that that risperidone dose is combined with chlorpromazine, um, 300 milligrams daily, um, and the maximum dose in psychosis for chlorpromazine is 400 milligrams per day. So that's a, a very large dose of chlorpromazine. Um, so the other thing that's important to remember about chlorpromazine, which has certainly been around for many, many years, um, it was one of the very early antipsychotics to be um, developed and used. Um, it does have um, activity to photosensitize. So the message about slip, slop, slap and cover, of course, is crucial. Um, and we might want to think about choosing another or an alternative antipsychotic for Josh because Josh actually does like to spend time um, outdoors. So um, you know, that's, you know, something that's really important to think about. Um, so, you know, chlorpromazine at that high dose especially has tendencies to cause um, sunburn and um, it would be useful to think about an alternative. So first generation antipsychotics such as chlorpromazine are all approved for use in behavioural disturbance, but um, their evidence for benefit is actually lacking. Um, the atomoxetine dose um, on observation was packed in a blister pack um, and the, um, the, the, after the second dose of the day in the blister pack um, was being given at night um, rather than um, late afternoon as it is recommended. So in actual fact, um, Josh is really sleeping through any potential benefits that that second dose uh, might be providing. So that's something to think about. Um, and that would be in conjunction with the, the pharmacy that does the, um, the packing um, of those medicines. So to get that um, second dose of the day into an, an afternoon time slot so that it's given um, at an appropriate time. The other thing that's really important with antipsychotics is the, the monitoring of adverse effects. And there's a whole raft of adverse effects. And as pharmacists, we would like to know that um, these monitoring uh, requirements are in place. So we're talking about lipids, we're talking about HbA1c, um, we're talking about prolactin, uh, weight. So um, all of these medications um, will um, have a tendency to increase weight. Um, and so BMI will increase. And that, of course, um, gives gives rise to a whole lot of other considerations such as cardiovascular disease, risk, risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, we're also looking at monitoring blood pressure, extrapyramidal side effects, and as I mentioned earlier, dry mouth, something really important. And the follow-on from dry mouth are then issues with swallowing, issues with teeth and dental hygiene. So the um, that's something that's really important for carers to focus on with patients taking antipsychotics is um, appropriate dental hygiene. And of course, the other thing too are the cardiac effects from the atomoxetine. So really important there. They're rare, but um, they can occur. So that's just a very brief rundown of a very brief um, medication review um, for Josh and his current medications. So really, in just wrapping up, I'd like just like to thank everyone. Thank Coralie, thank you um, for for being here. Um, Andrew, as always, and Connie, thanks for for joining us with your um, with your insights. I just like to remind everyone about the health pathways um, on the particularly with in related to um, intellectual disability, and the so you can search up some information um, on there. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Spider team. Uh, for all their hard work uh, with Kerry and Nicole who've, who've joined us today and all their hard work um, with the ECHO um, and Whitney for organising everything and trying to get those videos running tonight. Thank you. I'd like to remind everyone about the primary care conference, um, which is, oh, case study. Uh, the primary care conference is on, on the weekend um, and we are actually running a session on transition from um, childhood into adulthood through the, the different care systems. Um, and um, I'm facilitating that that presentation. So that's a, through the SPIDER project there. So that should be a good weekend. 
Um, just like to remind people about case study submissions, if everyone has a case study um, that they'd like to submit and um, there is an evaluation so we can sort of keep an eye on how these sessions are going with the evaluation session. Um, so thanks once again. I'd just like to remind you that in a fortnight's time on the, the 2nd of June, um, the next ECHO session will be about the impact of diet. Um, and our presentation will be presented will be Helen McCarthy, who's a senior lecturer in dietetics. Um, and our panel members will be uh, Marjorie Pithouse from GenU, um, Sane Dalton from Dietitians Australia, and Monica Wellington, who's a community partner coordinator. And so I look forward to seeing people then. So thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, and we'll look forward to the next echo. Thanks, guys.